Hey guys, today I want to talk to you about being Christians, but yet not being weaklings, okay? I don't know why there's this misconception that just because you're a Christian, you know, people are just supposed to run all over you and do whatever they want and people just kind of, you would just let people kind of get away with stuff because we're like, well, you know, we're just supposed to let them go. Um, or also another thing that I've seen is just so many Christians, even in business, not understanding how to still be a strong and firm leader and still be a Christian. Because somehow we have this understanding that Christianity, because of Christianity, everything is turned the other cheek. And that's not the case. Okay, so we want to clarify that today. Um, so the three things we'll need to understand to be able to understand how to be a Christian and still have your backbone. Uh, we don't have to become invertebrates <laughs> just because we're Christians. Um, the first thing we'll need to understand is how to live strong and courageously because that is actually a command. And then the second thing we'll talk about um, is the art of confrontation how to confront things that are not of God um, and to tear them down. Um, so the second thing, and then that, the third thing after that we'll need to talk about is learning how to say no, okay? Let your yes be yes and let your no's be no. So those will be the three things um, that we'll cover today. So this first section here, we're going to talk about being strong and courageous. And when we read Joshua 1, 9, he says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you. And he's literally saying, I'm with you wherever you go. Okay, so I think one of the things that we don't understand about this text is that this is a command. It's not a suggestion. He's not suggesting um, just be strong and courageous. It is a command. Okay, and when you go against a command, you are out of order, okay? And if you are out of order, you're in disobedience, all right? Just like if you uh, if you are under a general and the general gives you a command and you disobey it, you are in trouble, okay? So um, instead of the same thing, I don't think we realize be strong and courageous is a command, is not a suggestion. Um, he says, have I not commanded you here? Be strong and courageous and do not be afraid for I, he's saying I myself, God, the one who created everything is with you. And I'm with you wherever you go, okay? So we don't have to be afraid to be who we are. One of the things that I'm seeing, even in society, when you look at the way things are now, it's almost like there's this subtle um, need to apologize for being Christians, okay? You don't see a Muslim apologizing for being Muslim. You don't you know, see um, somebody who um, does yoga or is in the new age apologizing for being in new age. But for some reason, Christians will be like, oh, well, I'm going to pray now, you know, hope I don't offend anybody. Really? <laughs> I'm going to pray in this restaurant. If you don't like it, you can go somewhere else. All right. So we need to look at these subtle things that are creeping up even in our society um, to cause us to, to, to almost be feel like you're feel feel bad about being Christian or feel like you're offending somebody because you're a Christian. OK, nobody else has to apologize for being who they are. So why do we do that? OK, so number one, stop apologizing for being Christian. Okay, the reason why most of us are not able to have the impact um, that God is desiring for us to have in these systems is because most of us are even afraid to tell people we're Christian. You don't even want the people at your job to know that you're saved or you definitely don't want them to know that you pray in tongues because they might think you're crazy. So what? Because <laughs> at the end of the day, when you really walk and carry the kingdom of God everywhere you go, Trust me, there is something that happens where there, there is a knowing, even of the people who don't believe, there is a knowing that God is with you, whether they act like they believe it or not. Because I guarantee you, if they know and you really carry the kingdom of God everywhere you go, I bet you, you'll be the first one they call when they start, when they get sick, they need prayer. If the doctor tells them they got a couple of days to live, you'll be the first one they call it. Okay, but we can't have that impact when we're afraid to let even, even let people know who we are. Because society has made it easy for everybody else, you know, to have religious freedoms, so to speak. But the Christians, oh, are offensive. Hold up, wait a minute. Do we not have rights? <laughs> like, like everyone else, right? So one of the first things we need to do is understand that we do need to live strong 
and courageously. And a part of living strong and courageously is being bold to be who we are and to be who God created us to be. And to be boldly able to proclaim that I do believe in God. I do believe that Jesus died for my sins. I do believe, you know, that he shed his blood for me. I do believe that by his stripes I'm healed. I do believe in all of the gifts of the spirit, including speaking in tongues. If you got a problem with it, too bad. (laughs) Change the channel. (laughs) Okay? So we have to... Be bold like that and understand that even Jesus was not a pushover. There's nowhere in the text except for the one little part where people try to turn, turning the other cheek into a a whole Christian doctrine. But Jesus was very bold. He was very direct. He was very blunt. He told people like it is. If they were acting like a brood of vipers, he called them a brood of vipers. Okay, because he started out with over 100 disciples. Literally, he had 120 disciples in the book of Acts. <laughs> okay, and then we read again in Luke, and now it's down to 72. And then he had 12. Okay, because every time he said something that offended somebody, they would leave. That's why when he got down to the last 12 disciples, he was like, y'all want to leave too? He wasn't running after them. Oh, I'm sorry, did I hurt your feelings? No, (laughs) because when you are a leader, you have to be able to be bold in who you are. If they don't like it, they can go. Okay, so number one, learn how to be strong and courageous. Hacks the Holy Spirit to show you how to be strong and courageous. Okay, because we there's we we just we just have this cliche where we we repeat this text over and over. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. But how many of us are actually doing it? Right, everywhere we go, whether it's on the job whether it's where you work, whether it's where you go to the gym or where you go to eat. Are you really strong and courageous or are you an undercover Christian? That is the first thing we need to do, guys. Um, First part, be strong and courageous. Learn how to live a fearless life. Another thing that I see a lot of Christians struggle with is the spirit of fear. Okay, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. He didn't give us fear. Another reason why most of us don't evangelize or talk to people about Jesus or talk to people we know, um, talk to our neighbors or anybody because of fear. All right. When we are afraid, we can't be strong and courageous and afraid at the same time. You got to pick one. And being strong and courageous is a command, not a suggestion. So you can't really pick fear because God didn't give you the spirit of fear. So if you pick fear, you're not picking God essentially. Okay. And if you do struggle with the spirit of fear, you can pray and ask the Lord to help you. You can come in for deliverance. You can pray and cast out that spirit of fear. Because if you understand that God didn't give you that spirit of fear, then why are you sitting there resting in it and allowing it to, to determine your life? Why are you allowing it to stop you, you know, from starting that business? Why are you allowing it to stop you from getting married? Or why are you allowing it to stop you from ministering to somebody about the word? Why are you allowing it to stop you from going over there and praying to that person? Why are you allowing it to stop you when the Lord gives you a word to go over there and prophesy to that person? God didn't give you the spirit of fear. So if you sit around and let fear keep you bound, that's not God's will. Okay, so now next thing we're going to look at um, in the next section is going to be looking at the art of confrontation. Okay, and then once we get rid of the spirit of fear, then we need to also learn how to confront the things in our lives that are not of God. The second thing we need to know is how to say no. Okay, let your yes be yes and letting your no's be no's. Okay, one of the things that I've seen even uh, amongst Christians, especially Christians in business, um, is this feeling that just because you're a Christian that you have to say yes to everything. Okay, you can say no and still be in love. Okay, for some reason, people associate saying no with like hating or just this negative connotation. And that's not necessarily the case. And just because you said no, does that mean it's mean? Okay, just like if you saw your child getting ready to stick their finger in a socket, you're going to say no, stop. (laughs) 
okay? And it's not out of hate, it's out of love, okay? Um, and I think that that same understanding needs to go all the way across the board, especially for Christians who are in leadership positions or Christians um, who are, and, and every Christian essentially is at some point going to be in leadership, all right? Because a lot of times, even when we look at the provision of God, and in order for him to bring that provision into our lives, you're going to get something, okay? He's going to give you some type of idea to do something, whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's starting a church, or whether it's starting a business, or whatever area he raises you up in, to be a leader, you have to know how to say no, okay? You can't fire somebody if you don't know how to say no, okay? Um so whenever God is putting you in charge of anything, um, which he is going to at some point, because even as a Christian, there's other things that you're going to do even outside of you no know, business or ministry, um, just in your everyday life, where you still have to learn how to be able to say yes or no. OK, we have this understanding somehow that just because you're saved or because you're a Christian now, if somebody asks you to do something, you always have to say yes. No, that is not the case. And because you don't say yes, does that mean that you're, you know, uh, in sin or something? Okay, so there has to still be a balance. Um, so Matthew 5, 37 says, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Okay, when, when it's not a yes or a no and you just flippy floppy all the time. Number one, you can't be a leader doing that. Okay, because if you don't know if you're going or coming, you can't lead somebody. If you don't know how to give somebody a firm yes or a firm no, you can't lead anybody. Nobody wants to follow a double minded man. Because if you don't if you if you if you're not somebody who can be firm enough to stick with a yes or stick with a no, then you are double minded, essentially. Okay, because then a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. How are you gonna lead somebody else if you don't know where you're going? If you don't know if you're going or coming, if you don't know if it's a yes or a no. And I think the, the main thing with people being afraid to say no is because they're afraid they're going to offend somebody. OK, understand even when you're in leadership, especially for those of you um, who are in starting a Christian business or uh, even a nonprofit or anything you're starting where you're going to be leading people. You have to learn how to say no. OK, because there are going to be some decisions that you make where half of the group is going to want to want a yes and the other half is going to be for a no. <laughs> OK, you have to be able to make the, the best decision for your company or your organization and be able to stand with it and stand by that decision. So if it's a, if it's a no, then it's a no and understand. Yes, some people are going to be mad because you said no, and that's perfectly fine. OK, we don't have to have this fear. Of, of saying yes or no. Um, and another thing too, um, that no comes in very, very, very um, handy for and knowing how to say no, is even when you're operating in self-control. Okay, if you have the spirit of self-control, you're gonna have to learn how to say no, even to yourself. Okay, if the Holy Spirit is saying, don't eat that apple pie, you gotta be able to tell yourself no. Okay, and same thing even with temptation. If you don't know how to say no, you're going to find yourself falling into all types of things because somebody asked you to do it. You want to go to the club with me? Oh, sure. I can't say no. Okay, so we have to, so that it's necessary and healthy to say yes and to say no. And whatever one you say, you need to be able to stick by it. Okay, if you already know, okay, you're not supposed to be hanging out with this guy and you guys are not married and you know if you hang out, you'll be fornicating or whatever. You can't tell him no one minute. And then 10 minutes later, you texting him, oh, come over. Like, <laughs> you can't be flippy floppy. Like, you really, you have to know. If it's a no, let it be no. And if it's a yes, let it be yes. Okay, so that's another thing that I'm seeing, um, even in the body of Christ, um, and, and, and understanding that you can be saved, and it's still okay to say no when you need to say no. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Okay, whether somebody gets mad about it, or if somebody is offended about it, understand that you cannot please everybody. And if you have a conviction for, of something from the Holy Spirit, then you need to stand by what you are convicted to do. Okay? You have to. <laughs> I mean, Daniel wouldn't have been in the lion's den if he had just gone along with everything they were doing. He had to say, no, I'm still going to pray to my God. And you're not going to tell me <laughs> that I can't. OK, so if we don't have that ability to be able to say no when we need to, 
then essentially, I mean, what, what are we really standing up for? Because in order to stand up for something, you have to be able to stand against something else. Okay, and I think a lot of us are afraid of the standing against something, so we just want to be neutral. Oh, yeah, I know, you know, the whole thing happens with Roe versus Ray, but I'm not going to speak on it. I'm just going to be neutral. Really? Do you stand by it or are you against it? Nobody wants to take a stance when it comes to saying, well, I'm against something. Because... You might be labeled as, oh, you're a hater. When did it matter what people label you when you're standing up for what you believe? They call Jesus all types of things. So why are we not bold enough to say no when we need to say no? Okay, the reason why they were able to successfully take prayer out of the schools and all of these other little things that we see in society that we're being, being bombarded with, even in the movies and things like that, that are not Christian. The reason why it's happening is because nobody said no to it. Okay. When they went to take prayers out of the school, nobody said no. And if they did, obviously it wasn't a great enough impact to make a difference. So there is a part of this walk with God where you have to be able to stand up for what you believe and you have to be able to say yes for the things that um, are of God and say no to the things that are not of God. And the same thing even goes um, when you're running a Christian business, okay? Just because you have a Christian business does not mean that you have to just let people do whatever they want to do. I was talking to um, somebody the other day and he has like a program um, for young boys to play it was like a some sports um that they would play and he was like oh a third of the, the kids in there their parents haven't paid and i'm like why are they still there <laughs> like you you haven't enforced okay you're not coming to the next game until it's paid okay so we i, I think we have this understanding that we could just we don't have to charge people because we're christians huh if you have a business and you don't stand by your policy, that's still double-mindedness, okay? If our policy is a no-refund policy, then I'm going to enforce it, <laughs> okay? Um, and there is nothing that is unchristian about that. Because if you have a policy and you don't stick to your policy and you just letting people get away with whatever, that's double-minded, that's unstable. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Have your policy, stand by it, let that yes be yes, and let that no be no. And you don't have to feel bad about it because you are enforcing what you already have been made known. Okay? Um, so that's another thing that I'm seeing a lot of Christians, you know, just letting people um, call them to do whatever, or taking up all their time during the day, and or they're just doing a bunch of business services for free, and they feel bad about charging somebody. Guys. Okay, when you go to any place of business, they charge you. Okay, if you call an attorney and you need services, you have to pay for their time. Okay, if you, you know, go to the doctor and you need those services, you have to pay for their time. So what is it that happens on the inside of us that makes us not feel like we're worthy enough to ask for payment for our business services? You pay every other business you go into. So is, is it really, is it really just the spirit of fear or is it some type of inadequacy that we're feeling that makes us feel like we're not valuable enough to ask for compensation for our time? Come on. Yes be yes. No be no. No, I'm not going to do that. You're not on my calendar for today. No, I will call you tomorrow. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. So the next thing we're going to look at um, is also going to be the art of confrontation. So let's look at that next. So that's taking it to a whole nother level um, beyond just saying no. All right, guys. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the art of confrontation. Okay. So it's great to be strong and courageous. And to have your yes be yes and your no's be no's. 
But remember what I said, if you're standing for something, then you also have to be willing to stand against something else, right? So when it comes to standing against something, sometimes you are required um, or it is necessary to have confrontation, okay? So many people are afraid of just the idea of confrontation and they just kind of shy away from it. But confrontation is necessary for everything, okay? Um, I've heard of, you know, just from different people that I've talked to, where it's like they just have this really, really bad fear of just confronting anything. So people will be mad at each other for years just because they don't want to have a conversation <laughs> with the person about what they said about them, okay? A lot of times the enemy also uses this, um, this fear of confrontation to keep us in bondage, to keep us in offense, because nine times out of 10, if you were really just sit down with that person and have a conversation with them, you probably wouldn't have been offended, okay? Because a lot of times we take things completely different or wrong than what that person actually, how that person actually meant, meant us to take it. And then we just go off in the corner and then let the enemy continue working on us. Well, why did she say it that way? Why did they do that? And then, da, 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 da. And then before you know it, you're completely in offense. Now you're not talking to this person. Do that a lot with family members, okay? Friends and family, we've done that a lot too, right? So some of you who are hearing this right now, there is probably somebody that you need to confront. So confrontation is not all, always a negative thing. You know, if somebody said something to you and, you know, it came off wrong and you somehow feel offended about it, it's okay to ask them to have a conversation, Okay, so confrontation, I think a lot of times when we think about confrontation, we think it's a fight or something. Which you're going to end up arguing or being in a fight. And you can have confrontation that is productive. You can say, hey, I would like to have a conversation with you about this thing, you know, that or you said something to me and it just didn't sit right with me. You know, and I would like to just talk. And you literally sit down and say, hey, you know, you said this. And the way that you said it, you know, it just, it didn't sit right with me at all. You know, I, I, I don't really, I don't want to get offended about this. Did you really mean it this way? Because this is the way that I took it. And then you actually let them talk and you talk through it. I guarantee you guys, 99% of the time, you'll find yourself not even feeling offended anymore when you really start doing that. But because so many of us, you know, allow that fear of confrontation to come in, we sit around for years angry about somebody and then sometimes years later you find out that what you were what you were upset about wasn't even the case <laughs> but if you had just confronted not being afraid to confront the situation and understand you're not confronting the person you're confronting the issue okay and, and that's one thing to um, understand when it comes to healthy confrontation you're not confronting that person this is not like a person against person thing you're letting them know, hey, this is the issue that we have at hand here. I would like to discuss this. This is how it made me feel. Is this how you meant it? Okay, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's the approach that you want to take. You don't want to come in an, uh, a defensive tone or argumentative tone. Um, when you are confronting somebody when it comes to you know, something that you were hurt about or something like that. Okay, so for some of you, I feel like this was for you because there's somebody that you need to have that conversation with that you've been holding, um, you know, unforgiveness towards or they said something to you or they did something to you um, that this might be bring some healing for you. Okay, so that's that aspect of confrontation when it comes to our private lives. And then another aspect of the confrontation is also even in the kingdom of God. Okay, if we stand for the things of God, then we have to stand against the things that are not of God, okay? And we cannot remain neutral as Christians because if you're neutral, you are lukewarm and he will spew you out of his mouth. And I love this text and I'm in Jeremiah 1.10 here. Um, and it says, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow to build and plant, okay? So he's literally, God is literally telling, this is in Jeremiah, he's telling him, look, I appoint you. So when you're appointed to do something, it's you have, an, you have a responsibility to do it. Just like if you're appointed president or appointed 
king or queen, you have a responsibility to carry out and fulfill something with what in, in, in regards to what you are appointed to do. Okay, and he's telling them, you are appointed to do this. I'm pointing you specifically over the nations and the kingdoms to uproot and tear down and destroy and overthrow, to build and plant. So he's literally telling them, yes, I know the kingdoms of the world are going to have evil systems, but I'm appointing you to go uproot them, tear them down, destroy them, overthrow them, and then build and plant the kingdom. It's, it's very plain. It's right here. Okay. The problem is people are afraid to do it. And we have so many people who God has raised up, even given them wealth and given them influence, and they've forgotten what they were appointed to do. Okay. And then to go even further, let's look at Deuteronomy 12, 1 to 3, because it's telling us exactly what we need to uproot and do in these kingdoms and nations. And Deuteronomy 12, verse 1 says, these are the statutes and judgments which you shall observe to do in the land, which the Lord thy God of thy fathers give thee to possess. So he's talking about this, the promised land that he sent them into. He says, these are the statutes and judgments of what you should do and what things that you should observe to do in this land, which the Lord your God and the God of your fathers has given you to possess it all the days that you live upon the earth, all the days that you live upon the earth, which means this is still uh, for today, okay? You shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which you shall possess served their gods upon the high mountains, upon the hills, under every green tree, and ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire and ye shall hewn down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place <laughs> the problem is god has raised up all these people given them influence sent them into the promised land and then they get there and forget what they're there for or don't even realize what they're there for you're not there to become a celebrity you're not there to be with the who's who's. You're not there to hang out with them. God sends you to that place, to that nation and into that kingdom of the world so that you could tear down the evil systems, so that you can overthrow their altars, so that you can break the pillars, so that you can utterly destroy all of the places where they serve their gods. And then you can build and plant the kingdom of God there. That is the whole assignment. But so many people that God has raised up and taken them to these high places and they in there enjoying the big grapes, right? They go into the promised land and they forget the reason why they're there. They just there to enjoy the big grapes. Because the Bible said that the promised land had big grapes and stuff. So many that he's raised up get there and it's like they have amnesia while we're here. We're just here, you know, to enjoy. But there is an assignment that we're appointed to do that we're not doing. Everybody wants to be wealthy. Everybody wants the influence. Everybody wants the impact. If he gives you the influence and he gives you the impact, what will you do with it? Because this is what he wants you to do with it. And for those of you who already have that influence and God has already placed you in that place and you've gotten comfortable don't forget why you're there. This is why he gave it to you. This is why he took you into the promised land. Because he already appointed you over the nations and the kingdoms to uproot, tear down, destroy, overthrow, and then to build and plant the kingdom of God. You're not there to hang out with them. You're not there to be famous. You're here to utterly destroy the places where they serve their gods. To overthrow their altars. So that we can build and plant the things of the kingdom of God. That's why we're there. Okay, so there is this confrontation that is necessary for the kingdom of God to advance. Okay, we have to stop being comfortable with this place where oh, we're just Christians. We're just waiting for Jesus to come back. 
the kingdom of God is supposed to be advancing. But why does it look like the devil's kingdom is advancing everywhere you look? Because they understand this mandate. They understand that they're supposed to be advancing. That's why they're working to do the same stuff that we're not doing. They're working to overthrow our altars. They're working to remove our prayer out of the schools. They're working and advancing their kingdom because we've forgotten what we were appointed to do. And we're not doing it. We're just seeking after other stuff. We want the promised land, but we don't want what we're, what we're appointed to do in the promised land. And because we're not doing it, the enemy's kingdom is advancing. They're pushing everywhere they can to push Christianity out of it. What we're supposed to be doing. We're the ones that's supposed to be uprooting, tearing down. But they're working hard to uproot and tear down Christianity. So when we don't do what we were appointed to do, somebody else is going to do it and your opponent is going to do it. This is where confrontation becomes necessary. Okay, where would the people of God be if, Goli if David hadn't decided to stand up against Goliath? Everybody's standing around scared because nobody wants to confront the big giant in the room. Guys, <laughs> it's time for the body of Christ to really understand what we're appointed to do and understand that being neutral is not okay. It is not okay. The kingdom of God is supposed to be advancing. And advancing requires uprooting, tearing down, destroying, and then building and planting. And I know it's scary because, you know, these are deeply infiltrated systems that seem like a Goliath. But if God is for us, then who could be against us? And hasn't our God done enough to show us enough that we can really be strong and courageous and not be afraid because he is with us? Has he not done enough to show us that? So just to kind of wrap things up, guys, wherever you are in your life, I really want you to just think about this. Are you living courageously? Do the people at your job even know you're safe? Okay, I want you really to just begin to ask yourself these questions. All right, guys, just to wrap up everything that we talked about, remember, if you want to be that Christian that is able to live and still have a backbone, be saved and still have a backbone, remember the three things here. Remember to live fearlessly, live where you're strong and courageous. Remember to let your yes be yes and your no be no. And then also when there are things in your life or when God is taking you into a place, understand that you are there to be able to confront the systems that are not of God. Because if you stand for him, remember that you also have to be able to stand against what is not of him. So I'm just going to pray with you guys really quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for everyone that watched this Today, I thank you even for the power, Father, for even those that are struggling with the spirit of fear. I decree and declare, I break the power of fear, and I command every spirit of fear now to loose this hold and to come up and out and go to the abyss in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that this will be the season where they will learn how to work strong and courageously how to be able to wax bold with the firepower and authority of the Holy Spirit to be able to overcome that fear and to be strong enough to be able to stand firm in their decisions and also to be able to confront when you send them into a system to confront something, to be bold enough, to know that they can be strong and courageous, to know that you are with them and that they don't have to be afraid. And if you lead them to confront, 
It is for a reason. It is for your kingdom to be established. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that this shall be the season where we see the kingdom of God established in every aspect of our lives. And for those of you who are watching, who are not familiar with the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God has come unto you today, and this shall be the season where the Lord shall show himself real to you. The Lord shall show himself to you, whether it be in a dream or a vision, but you will get to know him as he is in all of his glory. In the name of Jesus, this shall be the season that yokes shall be broken off of your neck. In the name of Jesus, this shall be the season where your feet shall be loose from the snares of the fowler. You shall walk in the blessed places that God has for you. But even as you walk in the places that are blessed, that you'll also remember that you are there to establish the kingdom of God and you shall be able to do it boldly without fear, without hindrance and without delay in all power and authority, just as Jesus was bold enough to overcome the world in everywhere he went to bring the kingdom of God. We shall be bold now in the name of Jesus. And even the sons of God that are asleep, I speak to you now and I command you to wake up in the name of Jesus. And I decree and declare that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is quickening you right now in the name of Jesus. I quicken you in your callings. I quicken you back into your rightful place. Those of you who have backslidden in the name of Jesus. And I decree and declare this shall be the season where you will have the power to walk even in self-control. I loose unto you and I impart into you the spirit of self control in the name of Jesus. You shall be able to go forth and do it. And for those of you who the enemy has knocked out of your purposes and you feel like you're not even here and for a reason anymore, and you even might be suicidal. I break the power of the spirit of suicide now in the name of Jesus and every spirit of death I bind you. I command you to loose these vessels now in the name of Jesus. They will not prematurely die, but they shall live and not die and they shall accomplish everything that God has called them to do in the name of Jesus. And to you, I also speak to those who have the spirit of suicide. I decree and declare this shall be the season where you shall have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of who God is. And you shall know the hope of his calling. You'll know exactly what it is that you're called to do. You'll know what you're on this earth to accomplish and you'll realize how great it is. And when you begin to put your focus on it, you'll find a new joy, the joy that joy, I'm imparting that joy of the Lord into you now. That perfect, that perfect peace shall come with it as well. And it's going to cast out every fear and you'll have a new reason to live. And you'll be excited about life because you'll know you're here. And that the that Lord puts you here for a great purpose. So it is in the name of Jesus, I pray. I put the blood of Jesus over you guys today, over your homes, over your household, and over your children. In the mighty name of Jesus. And I'll see you again on the next show. Bye-bye. Patience Dean has had multiple encounters with the supernatural, including a visit to heaven where she saw that all of us have a book, and within each book are all of the plans for our lives. She saw that most people are not living their books. So many kingdom businesses, books, and inventions are being stagnated by the enemy. In Patience's powerful encounters with God, she found the place where business and the supernatural converges. Now she wants to teach you how to overcome every strategy of the enemy to launch that business, write that book, or get patent pending on that brilliant idea. Do you feel out of purpose, as if losing the battle against time? Are the promises of God stagnant in your life? Do you feel a tug from God to start a business? Stop fighting alone and call Patience Dean Studios now. Let us help you break through to live the abundant life that is already written for you. you.